Now we all know that the industry rate is horrific when it, terms, when it comes to when people walk in the door and how many people complete flight training. But the answers are all pretty simple. It's too hard, it takes too long, and it costs too much money. And we've known this forever. The only thing surprising about this information is that anybody would find it surprising. So what is it that we're doing to try and fix those kinds of things? And with any kind of an experiment, you have to start out with a hypothesis. And ours was that simulation can make a substantive impact on these kinds of GA issues. And by that, I mean not just the technology for teaching, teaching instruments, teaching primary training as well. We also made an agreement that we're going to study anything, and that by that mean we mean the soft factors, and that is how the building is laid out, what the customer relationships are going to be. And we learned a lot as we did that. And as Jerry said, our commitment was that we were going to try and fix things until we got them just right and then break them again and figure out if there's a better way to do it because this industry has so long gotten stalled in a mindset that has followed a regulatory process and it seems inexorable that we can't continue along those lines when in fact we can jump ship and make some changes. Now I have one unique test limitation in the Skyport that probably impacts it as a laboratory a little bit is I have to graduate pilots and those pilots have to be more knowledgeable, more skilled and they have to complete their training faster and when I say more because I take it as a you know part of my personal reputation that the people who graduate from this particular flight school really are prepared to face the challenges that they're going to see when they get out into the national airspace system. The other problem I have is obvious. I can't do destructive testing on the customers to see what their structural limits are. Now this is going to impact any test in that we can't really do completely blind studies yet. And when we talk to this afternoon about maybe what some of your suggestions are, we are now, we now have the capability to record and analyze data that we can allow control groups to come in here that we can take to their structural limits. We can give the lab rats cancer and see if we can cure them. If we don't, it really doesn't matter. Now we had to start off with some initial assumptions on how we were going to fix this problem. And of course, I had to be careful not to influence the test. So as long as any deviation from plan did not take us outside the limits I thought were going to be you know, a negative impact on our learners, I allowed it to go where it might. Part of that is because no matter what plan you have in place, if it doesn't run when you're not there, if it doesn't work autonomously, if the autopilot doesn't hold heading, it's broken. And we wanted to find out what those deviations were going to be along the way. Now what I'm not going to cover is simulation and instrument training because I think we all have a pretty good handle on what that's done. I'm not going to talk about management issues or financial models. Jeff's going to talk about those a little bit later on today. But anytime you want to get together on a break, I'm sure we could tell some stories. Avidyne is the brand of choice for pilots who want innovative, easy to use avionics. And the new IFD 540 and 440 FMS GPS Navcoms set a new standard for ease of use and simplicity. As plug and play replacements for legacy 530 and 430 series navigators, the hybrid touch user interface of the IFD 540 and IFD 440 makes it much easier to access the information you want while reducing head down time and making flying more enjoyable. Now you have a choice, and the choice is easy, Avidyne. What I do want to discuss is not new. Many of the things that we do here, you all know in the back of your mind this was a good idea, but these are all ingredients, and perhaps what we're really talking about today is what the recipe is to make this ingredient work. You know, and they have a saying in Texas, you know, this ain't no rocket surgery. <laughs> and that's very true in that if, if any of you are surprised from what I say today, then I am surprised that you haven't thought about it yourself. So we're going to talk about ways to put the recipe together. Now I'm going to cover each of these assumptions individually, but we all know that they're inexorably twined. You, you can't separate one from the other. And by the way, a test that is probably worthwhile is to see, well, if you've got these good ideas, if you take one away, how does that impact the others? And of course, that's a complicated study, but we're ready to do that now as well. One of the things that we talked about before we ever got going with groundbreaking is how we're going to have the physical layout of the building. And you'll notice as you walk around, there are no barriers to the customer. This created a problem for us in the initial stages because nobody builds these kind of items. So we had to design and build furniture that allowed this building to be about the needs of the customer, not the needs of the staff. Let me say that again. Everything we do here is about the needs of the customer not about the needs of the staff. 
One of the things you'll see out in the flight room, and it's not a very crowded picture now, but we had to design a layout and desks that would allow the customers to be studying in the flight room and the CFIs to interact better with them. There are no CFI offices anywhere in the building. I have a very harsh opinion about those, but the big problem is that I do not want a customer feeling like they have to be invited into the instructor's office. It's like getting called into the principal's office. I want the instructors out where the customers are. And what we found out by that is that when the instructors are mixing with the customers at all times, there's a social interaction. And I know that people have studied that. And uh, you know the fundamentals of instruction handbook tell me that social interaction is important in flight schools. I don't particularly bring that to the table. I have assistants who do that and very capable social instructors. But they do, what I did find out is that there's a lot more intellectual interaction with the customers because when they have a question, there is always somebody there immediately who can answer their question. So when they get bogged down in this, in this, in this abyss of information that they have to assimilate in three weeks, somebody is there to help them out and they don't have to spend too much unproductive time. We also thought that watching others in the simulator would be instructive and engaging. And guess what? We asked the folks up there and they have a product that can do that. This represents the wall right now. We're going to take this interaction a little bit further. We are now pretty close to being able to dedicate an instructor, for example, if we have a group of customers in an instrument training program, by using these monitoring devices to act as a live ATC controller to give them the kind of pacing and non-responsive answers that they will get from real ATC as opposed to the responsive answers they get from our simulated ATC. And that, in fact, will have some value as well. An interesting thing about the building, we found out we didn't have enough internet bandwidth to handle the customers because they were all on their iPads doing their learning. And this was not so much a hardware issue, although we did have to solve that. What it showed us was that it highlighted that the new generation of learners do not pick up textbook. They are e-learners. And we had to adapt our training methodologies to be suited for e-learners. And our rule here is that all instructors do their instruction from and the customers get their training from the iPad as the delivery device. Welcome to the Aero News Network, the aviation world's most comprehensive news and information resource. Real-time, 24-7 online, audio, and video programming, where aviation has been getting updated for over a decade. Distributing over 11,000 stories, features, audio, and video programs every year, only ANN covers aviation and aerospace with this much depth, insight, and expertise. Check us out on the web at aero-news.net. For those of you who remember me from the CPC days coming up in every single CPC event and talking about the destructive nature of the CFI customer relationship, you know that I am an advocate that we do not want any accomplished person, whether it's a type A personality or a double A personality or when you get up into my range of triple A personalities, to ever feel like they are less than when they are in a position where they are paying for learning. Now, unfortunately, the CFI learner dynamic quickly degenerates into a superior, inferior relationship. And it's hard to create a PIC mentality. That is, if someone comes in for a private pilot certificate, that person has to function as the pilot in command with that kind of a mentality somewhere between a week to 10 days in a three-week program. And we certainly can't put them in a position where they've been treated inferiorly. We have to make sure they understand that they have to be able to make decisions and what that involves. Now, we all know this is true, but boy, did I find out how hard it was to control on a daily basis. There's a term here that I, that I hear occasionally uh, from one of my uh, very endearing part-time uh, instructors, and that is, I teach my students. Now, how many ways do I hate this phrase? Well, let's count them. One, I. <laughs> that instructor has just made this about me doing something. That instructor is doing something when in fact there is a whole network here that, that that learner has paid for to come in and do it. Teach. Who here teaches people to fly? Raise your hand. Don't raise your hand because you've been to my seminars. You can't do it. Okay, so don't put your hand up and be foolish. We will mock you for doing it. The point is that learning to fly is a psychomotor skill that has to be developed by the learner. We are coaches at best. The third word there is my. They're not the instructor's students.
They are customers who come here to Skyport for training, and they're all part of the team. And of course, students, my last word, and I know it's been used today, and it's no, you know, it's no offense that you offend me with that, with that particular term. In this country, the word student invokes a superior subordinate relationship. It's just the way it is. It's just a word. But when we keep using that word, then the learner begins to feel that they are in a subordinate position, when in fact, the instructor's position is to elevate that person, at least on an equal basis, and oh, by the way, we have a whole network here that elevates the learner up to make sure that their needs are being achieved. So how many ways do I hate that sentence? There's four words and four ways I hate it. Now, we don't hire any CFIs with pedantic personalities, so I'm not saying that we, we have those kind of issues with our instructors. But it's very easy for an instructor to start directing activities. And it is very easy for someone who has been accustomed to rote learning, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, to look for rote direction. All of that is fine, except when you have to hand them the keys of an airplane to go solo. So let's talk about what we're doing on that later on. This is an ongoing effort on my part, and obviously, I think some of these issues in the industry are going to go away. As we train learners in a different way, they will eventually become instructors, and while they don't have a life cycle of a week or a day, as the fruit fly uh, <laughs> talked about, it's only about six months in our program before the average person can go from being a pilot to an instructor. So we will start seeing uh, turnover, and the people who have grown up in this system will have a lot less uh, desire to go back to the old-fashioned way of training.